about your language. <laughs> Uh, guys, we're on early because, because <laughs> Facebook is cantankerous and the uh, weather is wacky, so we'll start in 30 seconds. Good evening. It is 7 o'clock here in the northeast of the United States, and this is the Tibet Center, Kunshap Targu Ling, a Buddhist meditation and study center located in New York City in northern New Jersey, under the co-direction of His Eminence Chabje Ling Rinpoche and Rato Kensa Tukdin Lundup, also known as Geshe Nikki Vreeland. This is our twice-weekly presentation of the Buddha Dharma, specifically stages on the path to enlightenment. Tonight is a special uh, Edition. We are going to recite the tenth chapter of Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, in tribute to the life of Regina Smith, Darren's mother, who passed away last Saturday. Any problems with the sound or picture? Please text me right away. All the prayers we say are on the website, in the FAQ section. Scroll down to prayers. So, if you want to tag this talk tonight, we have three different topics. Number one. Uh, We'll do a little of the, we'll do the Shantideva's book in tribute to Mrs. Smith, Regina Smith. And then we'll do a little bit from the uh, Pali Canon, in other words, uh, the Majima Nikaya, in the Buddha's words, a little bit of practical instruction on how to handle these thoughts, chase them out of your mind, that keep bothering you. So, uh, what else do I have to mention? Nothing else. Anyway, so... We're saluting Mrs. Smith because he gave us Darren. And now we know where Darren's character comes from. Unusual woman. Unusual. Anyway, we will start. Prayer for the spreading of the teachings. By the force of the blessings of the non fallacious three precious gems and of the truth of our pure selfless wishes, may the precious Buddhist teachings flourish and spread to the expanse of all areas throughout the length and breadth of the West. For all the people living here together with their near ones, who have engaged in the teachings and have faith and respect for them, may all conditions adverse to their practice of the pure dharma be dispelled, and an excellent collection of favorable conditions increase like the waxing moon, and especially for those who work on methods to accomplish the flourishing and spreading of the victorious one's teachings, which are the source of benefit and happiness. May they never be oppressed by masses of interference and adverse conditions, and may this spontaneously happen just as we have hoped and wished. In the Heart Sutra. Thus have I heard once, the Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a big gathering of great monks and great bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi, which examines the dharmas called profound illumination, and at the same time, Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, looking at the profound practice of transcendent knowledge, saw the five scandals and their natural emptiness. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Avalokiteshvara, How should those noble ones learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? And Avalokiteshvara answered, Venerable Shariputra, Whoever wishes to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this, seeing the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Form is empty. Emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is not separate from form. Form is not separate from emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discriminating awareness, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Thus, all the dharmas are empty and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are not impure or pure. They neither decrease nor increase. Therefore, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discriminating awareness, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation, no objects of mind, no quality of sight, no quality of hearing, no quality of smelling, no quality of tasting, no quality of sensing, no quality of thought. 
no quality of mind consciousness. There are no nidanas from ignorance to old age, and that, no, they're wearing out. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, no non-attainment. Therefore, since there is no attainment, the bodhisattvas abide by means of transcendent knowledge. And since there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. They transcend falsity and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future by means of transcendent knowledge fully and clearly awaken to unsurpassed, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of transcendent knowledge, the mantra of deep insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering should be known as truth, for there is no deception. In transcendent knowledge, the mantra is proclaimed, Tayata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha. Well, Shariputra, this is how a Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should learn profound transcendent knowledge. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, profound, transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as you have taught, and the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara, that whole gathering in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, your hearts full of joy, praise the words of the Blessed One. Refuge in Bodhisattva vow, which we of course recite three times. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. May all the pains of living creatures ripen solely upon myself, and through the might of the Bodhisattva Sangha, may all beings experience happiness. May the teachings, which are the sole medicine for suffering and the origin of every joy, be materially supported and honored and abide for a very long time. I prostrate to Manjagosha, to whose kindness wholesome minds ensue, and I prostrate to my spiritual masters, to whose kindness I develop. Prayer for the swift return of Ratu Chungla Rinpoche, suggested by His Holiness and written by His Holiness. Exalted wisdom of all victors gathered in a drop, soul refuge manifest in the form of the one wearing saffron robes, Guru Lozang Tubuang Doje Chang. Please bear witness here today that our prayers may be fulfilled. We beseech the great torch of doctrine, accomplishing from long ago the vast waves of aspirational prayers, Lord of speech of the Victor Losang's teachings, spreading them to the ends of the earth by means of explanation and practice. Though holding the commitment, I will invite all beings to be my guests in unsurpassed, great awakening. Yet you have withdrawn the activities of the form body that serves the welfare of others. Is that worthy of the supreme among beings, the bodhisattvas? Though impossible for you till cyclic existences end, to abandon your commitment to liberate all beings, we beseech the new son of Nirmanakaya to swiftly return from the realm of Dharmakaya, brought forth by bodhicitta drawn by seven steeds. Having reached the far limits of scholarship, religious life, and goodness, Please come swiftly as an unrivaled supreme emanation, full holder of the sage's teachings and wish-fulfilling jewel, return as the glory of Lozang Tenpei, magnificent truth of the three precious jewels, Mahakala, Karmayama, and Srimata Devi, and the ocean of Dharma protectors, may you spontaneously fulfill our wish, the swift blossoming of the reincarnation's fresh moonlight face. So as promised, in honor of Regina Smith's life, we will recite the 10th chapter of Shanti Deva's book, which Rinpoche, Chonglarato Rinpoche, that is, advised us to recite as much as possible, especially on the passing of someone. It's a tradition here. Very simple to understand. 
just a bunch of good thoughts following each other that you can generate. You don't have to be a great scholar. You don't have to be anything. <laughs> you have to be alive, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's chapter 10. You just listen and try and generate these thoughts yourself. This is the baseline motivation if you want to go to Buddhahood. These thoughts represent that. So, through the virtue of having composed this work, a guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, may all living beings come to engage in the Bodhisattva's conduct. May all beings everywhere plagued with sufferings of body and mind obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. For as long as they remain in cyclic existence, may their mundane happiness never decline, and may all of them uninterruptedly receive waves of joy from bodhisattvas. May all embodied creatures who throughout the universe experience hellish realms come to enjoy the bliss of sukha body. May those feeble with cold find warmth, and may those oppressed with heat be cooled by the boundless waters that pour forth from the great clouds of the bodhisattva's merits. May the forests of razor-sharp leaves become a beautiful pleasure grove, and may the trees of knives and swords grow into wish-fulfilling trees. May the regions of hell become places of joy with vast and fragrant lotus pools, beautiful with the exquisite calls of wild ducks, geese, and swans. May the heaps of burning coals change into heaps of jewels, and may the burning ground become a polished crystal floor, and may the mountains of the crushing hells become celestial palaces of worship filled with sugatas. May the rains of lava, blazing stones, and weapons from now on become a rain of flowers, and may all battling with weapons from now on be a, plain, a playful exchange of flowers. By the force of my virtues, may those caught in the fiery torrents of acid, their flesh eaten away, revealing their lily-white bones, obtain the bodies of celestials, and dwell with goddesses in gently flowing rivers. Why are the henchmen of Yama, the unbearable buzzards and vultures, afraid? Through whose noble strength is joy brought upon us, and darkness dispelled? Looking up, they behold in the firmament the radiant form of Vajrapani. Through the force of their joy, may they be free from wrongdoing and find his company. When they see the lava fires of hell extinguished by a rain of falling flowers mixed with scented water, immediately satisfied, they wonder whose work this was. In, that, in this way, may those in hell behold Padmapani. Friends, don't be afraid, but quickly gather here. What need is there to flee when above us is the youthful Manjushri to dispel our fears? the tender bodhisattvas who protects all living things, through whose might all suffering is removed and the force of joy abounds. Behold him in an enchanting palace surrounded, resounding with hymns sung by a thousand goddesses, with the tiaras of a hundred gods being offered to his lotus feet, and a rain of many flowers falling on his head, the eyes of which are moist with kindness. Upon seeing Manjagosha in this way, may those in hell cry out loud with joy. Likewise, having seen due to the roots of my wholesome deeds the cool and sweet-smelling rain falling from joyful clouds created by the Bodhisattva Samantabhadra and Sarvanivarana Viskamdini, may all beings in hell be truly happy. May all animals be free from the fear of being eaten by one another. May the hungry ghosts be as happy as the people of the northern continent. May they be satisfied by a stream of milk pouring from the hand of the noble lord Avalokiteshvara, and by bathing in it, may they always be cool. May the blind see forms, may the deaf hear sounds, and just as it was with Maya Devi, may pregnant women give birth without any pain. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, may the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those with weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find new hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their illness and may ever disease in, every disease in the world never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid. May those bound be freed. May the powerless find power, and may people think of benefiting one another. May all travelers find happiness everywhere they go, and without any effort may they accomplish whatever they set out to do. May those who sail in ships and boats obtain whatever they wish for, and having safely returned to the shore, may they joyfully reunite with their relatives. May troubled wanderers who have lost their way meet with fellow travelers, and without any fear of thieves and tigers, may their going be easy and without any fatigue. May those who find themselves in trackless, fearful wildernesses, the children, the aged, the unprotected, those stup stupefied and the insane be guarded by beneficent celestials. May all beings be free from all states of no leisure, 
and be endowed with faith, wisdom, and kindness, with food obtained in a proper manner, and excellent conduct, may they be mindful throughout their lives. May all beings be without want for wealth, just like the treasury of space, and without it being the source of dispute or harm, may they always enjoy it as they wish. May those who have little splendor come to be endowed with majesty, and may those whose bodies are worn with toil find magnificent and noble forms. May all lower life forms in the universe take rebirth in higher forms. May the lowly obtain grandeur, and may the proud be humbled. By the merits I have accumulated, may every single being abandon all, forts of, all forms of wrongdoing and perpetually engage in virtue. May they never be parted from the awakening mind, and may they always engage in the bodhisattva's conduct. May they be cared for by the Buddhas and relinquish the actions of devils. May sentient beings have lives inconceivably long when in fortunate realms. May they always live in contentment, unfamiliar with even the word death. May there abound in all directions gardens of wish-fulfilling trees filled with the sweet sound of Dharma proclaimed by the Buddhas and their children. And may the land everywhere be pure, smooth and devoid of any rocks, level like the palm of the hand and of the nature of lapis lazuli. For all the circles of disciples may many bodhisattvas dwell in every land, adorning them with their excellent manifestations. May all embodied creatures uninterruptedly hear the sound of Dharma issuing from birds and trees, beams of light, and even space itself. May they always meet with Buddhas and their children, the Bodhisattvas. Then may these spiritual masters of the world be worshipped with endless clouds of offerings. May celestials bring timely rain so that harvest may be bountiful. May kings act in accordance with Dharma and the people of the world always prosper. May all medicines be effective and the repeating of mantras successful. May Dakinis, cannibals, and the like be endowed with compassionate minds. May no living creature ever suffer, commit wrong, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled, or their minds ever be depressed. In all temples and monasteries, may reading and recitation flourish and remain. May the Sangha always be in harmony, and may their purposes be accomplished. May monks desiring to practice find quiet and solitary places, and through having abandoned all wandering thoughts, may they meditate with flexible minds. May nuns be materially sufficient to abandon quarreling with each other and be unharmed. Similarly, may all ordained ones never let their morality weaken. Having repented any moral faults, but may transgression always be eradicated, and thereby obtaining a happy state of birth, may st spiritual conduct not decline even there. May the wise be honored, and may they receive alms. May their minds be completely pure, and may they be renowned in all directions. May beings not experience the misery of lower realms, and may they never know any hardships with a physical form superior to the gods, may they swiftly attain Buddhahood. May sentient beings again and again make offerings to all the Buddhas, and may they constantly be joyful with the inconceivable bliss of the Buddhas. We have a customer here. <laughs> Just as they intended, may the Bodhisattvas fulfill the welfare of the world, and may all sentient beings receive whatever the Buddhas have intended for them. Similarly, may the Prachika Buddhas and the Shravakas find happiness. And until I reach the level of the joyous one through the kindness of Manja Gosha, may I be mindful throughout my lives and always obtain ordination. May I live and be sustained by simple common foods, and in all my lives may I find the ideal solitude for practicing Dharma. Whenever I wish to see something or even wish to ask the slightest question, may I be held without any hindrance, the Lord Manja Gosha himself. In order to fill the, fulfill the needs of beings who reach until the ends of space, May my way of life be just like that of Manjagosha. For as long as space endures and as for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide and dispel the misery of the world. May all the pains of living creatures ripen solely upon myself and through the might of the Bodhisattva Sangha, may all beings experience happiness. May the teachings which are the sole medicine for suffering and the origin of every joy be materially supported and honored and abide for a very long time. I prostrate to Manja Gosha through whose kindness wholesome minds ensue, and I prostrate to my spiritual masters through whose kindness I develop. So this will help her because in honor of her reciting this, and this puts very good thoughts into your head, into your mind, which goes on forever, and she caused that, so I'm not worried about it. It's an unusual being. So, let's see what time. All right, we have plenty of time. This is uh, from the, an anthology of discourses from the Pali, Pali Canon. In the Buddha's words, uh, 
edited and introduced by Brooklyn's own Biku Bodhi, Biku Brooklyn Bodhi, great monk, been around a while, big translator in the fundamental vehicle tradition, the Nikaya tradition, or the whatever you want to call it. We don't use Hinayana anymore. Theravada is more, Hinayana is a little, if it means lesser, but Theravada is southern, or elders, you know. Anyway, this is from Majima Nikaya. It's called The Removal of Distracting Thoughts. This is very real world about what happens in your mind. And uh, it's a little repetitive, but it has to be because that's the way our minds are. <laughs> but he's giving you little hints. And I remember Rinpoche saying the same thing, excuse me, keep good thought, keep good thought. What about visualizations, these highest practices, keep good thought? Well, every thought creates an after effect called karma. So you want good lives, keep good thoughts. That's simple. The removal of distracting thoughts. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Svati in, the, in Jeddah's Grove, and at the Pandika's Park. Yes, I remember. No. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks! That's all. <laughs> Direct. Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Right down to the basics. Here we go. Number one. Number two, rather. Second section, rather. Monks, when a monk is pursuing the higher mind, from time to time he should give attention to five signs. What are the five? I'll keep the pronouns as they're written. He uses he, 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 because he's talking to monks. Section three. Here, monks, when a monk is giving attention to some sign, and owing to that sign there arise in, in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion, then he should give attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome. Thoughts we just ran through in Shantideva's book, excellent place. Count to them, count to your bad thoughts, something like that. One technique. When he gives attention to some other sign connected with, with what is wholesome, then any e evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, composed, unified, and concentrated, just as a skilled carpenter or his apprentice might knock out, remove, and extract a coarse peg by means of a fine one, and those are like his fine nail banging the peg out of the socket to put a better one in. So too, when a monk gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, his mind becomes steadied internally, composed, unified, and concentrated. Next section, if, while he is giving attention to some other sign connected to what, what is wholesome, there still arise in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion, the three poisons, then he should examine the danger in those thoughts thus. These thoughts are unwholesome, reprehensible, resulting in suffering. Ah. When he examines the danger in these thoughts, then any evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion are abandoned, in him and subside. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, composed, unified in concentration, just as a man or a woman, young, youthful, and fond of ornaments, would be horrified, humiliated, and disgusted if the carcass of a snake or a dog or a human being were hung around his or her neck. So too, when a monk examines the danger in these thoughts, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated. The thoughts, as I said, have results. The results are what you reap. You know, that's the hand you deal yourself in the future. Next section. If while he is examining the danger in those thoughts, okay, there still arises in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion, then he should try to forget those thoughts and should not give attention to them. Remember the parallel of the good wolf and the evil wolf? Which one wins in the elder of the Indian tribes? The one you feed. Good thought, bad thought, feed the good thought. Buddha continues, when he tries to forget those thoughts and does not give attention to them, then any evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated. Composed, unified, concentrated. Just as a man with good eyes 
who did not want to see forms that had come within range of sight would either shut his eyes or look away. So too, when a monk tries to forget these thoughts and does not give attention to them, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated. Don't feed them. Next section. If, while he is trying to forget these thoughts and is not giving attention to them, then there still arises in him unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion. Then he should give attention to stilling the thought formation of these thoughts. When he gives a week, there's a note there, and in fact, I think I will read it because it's very informative if I remember. The translation of that is the Taka Samkara Santanam. We don't need that. The condition, cause, or root. In other words, the uh, sutra interprets the compound to mean stopping the cause of the thought. In other words, stop the cause of the thought. This is accomplished by inquiring when an unwholesome thought has arisen. What's its cause? Where did this come from? What is the cause of its cause? Way down the line. Such an inquiry shows slows down and eventually cuts off the flow of unwholesome thoughts. Did you ever try to backtrack your thoughts? You see, that's what happens. So, a good way of controlling the mind. We all have these thoughts. Oh, you don't? No, we're we'll, we'll good for you. <laughs> anyway. When he gives attention, the Buddha continues, to stilling the thought formations of those thoughts, then any evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated. Just as a man walking fast might consider, why am I walking fast? What if I walk slowly? And then he would walk slowly. Then he might consider, why am I walking slowly? What if I stand? Then he would stand. Then he might consider, why am I standing? What if I sit? Then he would sit. Then he might consider, why am I sitting? What if I lie down? And he would lie down. By doing so, he would substitute for each grosser, grosser posture one that was subtler. So too, when a monk gives attention to stilling the thought formation of these thoughts, his mind becomes steadied internally, composed, unified, and concentrated. This is a very real world. This you can do as these thoughts race through your, your screen, there, your mental screen. Next section, if while he's giving attention to stilling thought formation, in other words, where they come from of those thoughts, there still arise in, in him unwholesome thoughts um, connected with desire, hate, and delusion, then with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of, roof of his mouth, he should beat down, constrain, and crush mind with mind. This is jihad. That's what they mean in uh, Islam when they say jihad. They don't mean running around and killing people. They mean fighting your internal enemy. A point that was lost, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, maybe not lost among the practitioners, but lost among the general people in certain societies. However, jihad is just this. And if you don't think it's hard, it is hard. It's a war in there. When, Buddha continues, with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, he beats down, constrains, and crushes mind with mind, then any evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated, just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down, constrain him, and crush him. So too, when with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, a monk beats down, constrains, and crushes mind with mind, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, and unified, and concentrated. Well, in, I'll insert a little advice from Rato Chungla gave us about the afflictions really overpowering us. And we're really, I mean, can't get rid of them, we're going nuts. And, and he should think it's like being pinned down in a fight and you can't get up and you can't do anything about them. They're just oppressing you. But at least you can clench your teeth and put on a scowl. So you're not going fully with it. That's his, so this is the same idea here. Don't let all of that energy go without noting it and trying to counter it. And so on. Next section. When a monk is giving attention to some sign, and owing to that sign there arise in him evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion, then when he gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, any such evil and wholesome thoughts are abandoned in him and subside, and with their abandoning his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated. Good qualities to have in your mind. Okay? Steadied composed, unified, not scattered, and concentrated. 
When he examines the danger in those thoughts, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, etc. When he tries to forget those thoughts, he does not give attention to them. His mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrating. He's concentrating. He's reviewing what he just said. When he gives attention to stilling the thought formation of those thoughts, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentrated. When his teeth clenched, and with his teeth, when with his teeth clenched, her and tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, he beats down, constrains, and crushes mind with mind. Any such evil, unwholesome thoughts are abandoned in him and subside, and with their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied, internally composed, unified, and concentration. This monk is then called a master of the courses of thought. He will, he will think whatever thought he wishes to think, and he will not think any thought that he does not wish to think. Think about that. He has severed craving, flung off the fetters, and with the complete penetration of conceit, he has made an end of suffering. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's word. And this is from Majima Nikaya, specifically uh, a subsection of that, the Vikana Satana Sutta. They call them suttas, not sutta. So, in this book, in the Buddha's words, wonderfully translated by the Brooklyn saint, Iku Bodhi, <laughs> best product Brooklyn ever produced. We got Brooklyn beer. <laughs> anyway, enough fooling around. Chapter 17 is where we're at now. Where we would like to be at. Our minds should be there. But it's continuing the insight section, and it's discussing what you negate, what you don't negate. Sounds like a lot of gibberish, but it's not. A lot of like philosophical below speak they might call you might call it but if you stop a second and try and internalize it you see they talk about exactly what we need to do it's a manual of instruction what we really need to do to get ourselves out of the horrible predicament of always suffering and get other beings out too so that's the gist of it this is on in volume three of the Lam Rim Chenmo we'll go to the root text first then we'll go to the commentary page 203 of this wonderful good exposition, great treatise, stages of the path to enlightenment. Okay. The actual object to be negated. So what are you doing in your mind that you got to get rid of to stop all the trouble? And we mean all the trouble. Not only stop it, but get it rid of it forever. Not just suppress it, but get rid of it totally. So how our system identifies the object of negation has three parts. We won't go through all the... the the uh, block outline. The actual identification of the object to be negated. Okay, how do we zero in on it? Mm -hmm. In general, with regard to objects of negation, there are objects negated by the path and objects negated by reason. Geshe Sobo examine, it will tell you what he means by the path. So let we, As to the first of these, Maitreya's separation of the middle from the extremes uh, says, there are teachings on afflictive obscuration and on cognitive obscuration. Afflictive is very gross, cognitive is subtle, subtler. We hold that all obscurations are among these, there's no other category, and when they're gone, you're free. Oh, good. Good news. How do we get there? Thus, there are afflictive obscurations and cognitive obscurations. These objects of negation do occur among objects of knowledge. So they're real, they're not in a certain way. <laughs> the one is it? <laughs> For if they did not exist, then all embodied beings would escape cyclic existence without exertion. They, they exist to the point that they, they affect us. Even though inherent existence doesn't exist, it, there's a, a conventional acceptance of it. Page 204, as for objects negated by reason, why do we use reasoning? Nagarjuna's refutation of objection says, someone thinks that an emanated woman is a woman like a hologram or something. Another emanation stops this wrong conception. This is like that. Same point is made by uh, his commentation on the refutation of obstructions, objections, rather. A woman emanated by some being is empty of the nature of being a woman. For instance, the magician creates this false image in people's minds because he recites mantras, he gives them something, and they see this thing, and they go all excited. Here's a real woman. Woohoo! Whoopee, the men do that. Maybe they create men. Well, I don't know. We'll get, we won't get into that. Who likes what? 
<laughs> it's an endless problem. So someone else wrongly think this is ultimately a woman. And they're fooled by it. Therefore, due to the wrong conception, attachment arises. Oh, the Tathagata or Sravaka, in other words, the Buddha or a hearer uh, of the Tathagata, emanates another emanation and thereby stop that, stops that person's wrong conception. Takes it off the screen, puts something, oh, that wasn't real. In those days, they had these magicians that could do that. I don't know. They put an audience in a trance and alter their sight. We have holograms and we have Madison Avenue to do that, so we have to worry. Similarly, Nagarjuna continues, my words which are empty are like an emanation, empty like an emanation, yet they stop that any apprehension that anything exists intrinsically or inherently. Right? The words themselves are empty, but they still work. They function. All things like the emanated women are empty and do not intrinsically exist. All. Pay attention to the word all here. Big thing. Thus, uh, Sankapa continues on page 204. Thus he speaks of misconceptions as objects of negation, and he also treats the intrinsic nature that they apprehend as an object of negation, making two kinds of objects to be negated. So, we misconceive what's there, and then there's an intrinsic existence that's appearing that we have to get rid of too. The appearance is not what it really is. It's appearing to us because of our corrupted mind. Mm. The primary object negation is the latter, intrinsic existence, yes. For in order to stop an inaccurate consciousness, you must first refute the objects which, which that consciousness apprehends. For instance, dependent arising refutes the essential intrinsic existence of persons and phenomena. This latter object of negation cannot be among objects of knowledge because if it did exist, then it could not be refuted. Inherent existence really doesn't exist, because if it really did, I can't get rid of it. Still, there are mistaken superimpositions. We think it exists. I know what I see. That apprehended as existing, so you must refute it. This refutation is not like destroying a pot with a hammer. No, break it, get it out of here. No, rather it is a matter of developing certain knowledge that recognizes the non-existent as non-existent. No, it's not there at all. What a mistake. That's it. When you develop certain knowledge that it does not exist, the mistaken consciousness that apprehends it as existing will stop. So, we logically, logically, logically say, can't possibly be, can't possibly see that, but I see it. That slowly, slowly, slowly stops the false appearance until you have a direct uh, realization of emptiness. But you start with the concept, with analytical thinking, and with concentration on uh, on that, those conclusions that you reach. Suddenly it turns into real thing. It comes to you, you might say, to be a little poetic. Oh. <laughs> That's a long, long trail for some. Some who have good roots, they achieve the direct experience quickly sometimes. I've heard. Similarly, Sankaba continues, bottom of page 204, Using reason to establish something is not a matter of newly establishing, establishing something that did not exist before, like a seed producing a seedling. No. Rather, it is the development of certain knowledge that recognizes a phenomena as it is. Oh, that's what's going on. Nagarjuna's refutation, refutation of objections says, what use is it to establish the negation of what does not exist anyway, even without words? Yeah, why are we bought? To answer that, the words do not exist cause understanding, they do not eliminate. We don't say it doesn't exist, and that can, it causes you to understand that it doesn't exist since it wasn't there in the first place. It can't eliminate something that was never there. That's all he's saying at the top of 205, those of you who are singing along. <laughs> in his commentary on that, Nagarjuna says he comments on everything, sets up a dialogue now. Question, if you're establishing the negation of something that does not exist even without words, without saying anything, then what is the use of your words? All things lack intrinsic nature. Yeah, what are you saying it for in the first one? The answer is, tune in next week, no. The reply, the words, all things lack intrinsic ignition, a, a nature rather, all things lack intrinsic nature, do not cause things to lack intrinsic nature, but in the absence of intrinsic nature, they do make it understood that things lack intrinsic nature. That's all, they cause an understanding. They don't get rid of it because it wasn't there in the first place. How's it going to get rid of it? 
Okay. For example, here's a very good one, and you might be reminded of uh, well, after the Cheech and Chong routine, uh, they're sitting around, obviously smoking, knock, knock on the door. Who is it? It's Dave. And then after five minutes, so they go back, Dave's not here. Something like that. It's coming up right now. For example, even though David Dada is not in the house, someone says, David Dada is in the house. In the house. <laughs> someone else, in order to show that David Dada is not there, says, David Dada is not there. <laughs> Those words do not cause David Dada not to be there. He wasn't there in the first place but merely indicate that David Dada is not in the house. Similarly, the words, things lack intrinsic nature, do not cause things to lack intrinsic nature. All things lack intrinsic nature, like creatures in a magical illusion. However, childish beings are confused, childish those who haven't seen emptiness directly, are confused about the absence of real essence in all things, so we make them understand that there is no intrinsic nature in the things that they, confused by ignorance, reify as having intrinsic nature. Very simple, easy to understand, and practical. Therefore, what you have said, that if there is no intrinsic nature, what use are the words, there is no intrinsic existence, inasmuch as things would be established as without intrinsic nature, even without any words, without saying anything, is not reasonable. There's a reason why we say it. You should understand this in accordance with this very clear statement. We're on 205 two-thirds down. Some hold that to conduct the extensive rational analysis required for refutations and proofs is to meander among mere conventional words, for all phenomena are devoid of refutation and proof in that if something exists, it can't be refuted. And if it does not exist, it need not be refuted. That's the key. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't have to be refuted, this guy says. This is a nonsensical collection of contradictions, showing neither general awareness of how reason establishes and negates things, nor general awareness of how the path establishes and negates things. For you claim that refutation and proof should not be done while you yourself are refuting your opponent's use of analysis that involves refutation and proof, citing as your reason, if something exists, it cannot be refuted, and if it does not exist, it need not be refuted. You're doing the same thing as accusing me of it. No big deal. Furthermore, your stated reason is not an appropriate refutation of an opponent who holds that it is necessary to conduct refutation and proof because according to you, if something exists, it cannot be refuted. And if it does not exist, it need not be refuted. I'll, I'll end at this paragraph. I'll go to Vyashe Sofa. We carry out refutations with excellent reasoning so as to stop inaccurate and mistaken conception. Very simple. That's the whole gist of it. Proof by reasoning is a technique for developing accurate and certain knowledge. Accurate and certain knowledge. Therefore, those who wish to stop the various inaccurate, inaccurate awarenesses and to develop the various accurate awarenesses should pursue the collection of arguments by authors such as Nagarjuna and should develop minds that have accurate and certain knowledge of refutation and proof. So that's very important. Uh, okay, we're ending on 206. We're going to shift to our friend and yours, Geshe Sopa, and go over the same material in a more aerated form, you might say, in a more modern idiom. I don't know. Where are you, Geshe Sopa? Get over here. Sorry. Shouldn't talk to a monk that way. In the Geshe. In Geshe Sopa is volume 5. The chapter starts on page 257. Actual object. We'll go right to the, read the block headings or anything. Objects negated by the path. What's a path? Ah, he starts with this. First he says there are two kinds of objects of negation. Objects negated by the path and objects negated by reasoning. Okay, he sets that up. Well, objects negated by the path. What's a path? A path is a purified mind. A realization of truth that eliminates mental obstructions. When you hear path, think that. Of course, it refers to a physical thing, but we have to use physical things to describe events in the mind because that's our only reference point. No. A path is a purified mind, a realization of truth that eliminates mental obscurations. We meditate on the stages of the path in order to remove both the afflictions, afflictions, afflictive emotions which block the attainment of liberation. Yes. That gets you out of samsara. The afflictions, they're gone. You're not in samsara. You know, you're in arhat. 
and the obstructions to omniscience which block the attainment of full enlightenment, then you're a Buddha. Okay, we'll explain what the obstructions to omniscience are later on, but that's something we should understand, the gross and the more subtle. As we progress with our meditation practice through successive stages of the path, we gradually negate, cease, or eliminate the obstructions pertaining pertaining to looking the page, no, to each stage, piece by piece. It is not appropriate to use the word refute with respect to the obstructions eliminated by the path, although we do use it when speaking about the objects negated by reason. So, technical term, but... Maitreya separate, separation of the middle from the extremes. The Madhyantaka Vibhama Karika says, and here's Maitreya himself, it is taught that there are the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. It is said that all obstructions are included within those, and once you have removed them, you are free. Okay, good. On 258, the two divisions of obstructions are definitive in the sense that all mental obstructions are included within them. That's it, that's the all-encompassing two things you need to know about getting rid of what you got to get rid of. There's nothing left out. Therefore, once we have completely removed both kinds of obstruction, we will have achieved the highest enlightenment, Buddhahood. Both kinds of obstruction exist as objects of knowledge. If they did not exist, then we would not have to do anything to be liberated. We wouldn't believe them and there would be no problem. We've... But because these obstructions exist within our mind streams, we are not free. We must eliminate them. We think there's intrinsic existence in our mind stream. Get rid of that stupid thought and you're free. Oh, it's not just stupid, it's uh, troublesome. Each of the Mahayana schools describes the afflictive um, uh, obstructions and the objection, obstructions to omniscience to, uh, differently. He's going to nerd out a little here because that's his style. But the Svatantrika Madhyamaka, the one step below the Prasangika, say that the ignorance grasping things as truly or utterly existent is an obstruction to omniscience. Not so. It's a little more subtler than that. But let them have their point for a while until they get used to it. In contrast, the Prasangika Madhyamaka, the highest school, say that this type of grasping is an afflictive obstruction and that the obstructions to omniscience are imprints left by the afflictive obstructions. Imprints, latencies, you could call them. Sometimes it's described as you have garlic in a jar, you get rid of the garlic, but the smell is still there, the imprints, the, the latencies left by it. You've got to cleanse, cleanse, cleanse to get rid of it. Something like that in our mind. And what do those uh, latencies do? They prevent omniscience. So he'll explain them. According to the prasanga, there's a perfectly omniscient mind is able to directly realize the two truths, ultimate truth and conventional truth, simultaneously. That's a Buddha's mind he's talking about within one moment of consciousness. A single consciousness can see everything clearly because there is no mental obstruction at all. That's a Buddha's mind. The Vibhashikas avoid using the term obstruction to omniscience because they do not believe that omniscience, as posited by the Mahayana, exists in the first place. That's the lowest school. Well, why do they do that? Because it's a rudimentary taking you by the hand and getting used to the philosophy and the arguing and then bringing you up to more and more subtle uh, points until you could really grasp the highest. Well, that's why. Set up purposely. So don't be uh, partial. <laughs> they say nothing is beyond the Buddha's knowledge. Therefore, an awakened being is able to know everything. So that's that. They explain it away. However, a single moment of a Buddha's consciousness cannot know everything simultaneously. A different wisdom perceives each object. That's what they say. The two types of obstruction accepted by prasangikas can be discussed in terms of their function and their nature. What is their function? Their function is described in their definitions in the monastic textbooks. The definition of an afflictive obstruction is an obstruction that primarily prevents the attainment of liberation. You got them, you're not in our hat, you're not out of samsara. The definition of an obstruction to omniscience is an obstruction that primarily prevents the attainment of omniscience. In other words, you get rid of them, you're a Buddha. Of course, afflictive obstructions are also obstructions to omniscience, but only in a secondary sense. Yeah, they're in the pile, but you know, you get rid of them, you still got more to get rid of. Hence the use of the qualification primarily in these definitions. Very, very strict with their words. 
That's the way they work. In terms of their nature, afflictive obstructions include the mental afflictions such as ignorance, hatred, and attachment, as well as their seeds, the after effects that are going to cause future situations for you when they sprout, when they meet conditions. So, Any consciousness that grasps its object incorrectly is an afflictive obstruction. The mental afflictions are consciousnesses. Their seeds are neither form nor consciousnesses. Neither form nor consciousness? What is this? The seeds are potentials left by the mental afflictions that enable the mental afflictions to arise again in the future. We think physically, so we think there has to be something. No, they're potentialities that ripen. That's all. Don't worry about where are they on what shelf over here. Let it go. <laughs> they are actual causes of the mental afflictions. Therefore, it is the most important to remove the seeds of the mental afflictions. They're there. If we just remove a mental, mental affliction itself, but do not remove its seed, its latency, then we only temporarily subdue it. For example, we can temporarily remove hatred by meditating on love. By meditating on the mental absorptions of the form and formless realms, we can temporarily remove many other mental afflictions too, temporarily. You're suppressing them, you're in these purer realms. Uh, you're not in the, in the desire realm pulled everywhere by sense objects. But you can get rid of them. You're still in samsara. So, in both cases, the mental afflictions can arise again because their seeds are still there. Obstructions to omniscience are the imprints left by the mental afflictions. These are similar to the seeds. They're not the seeds. The seeds get rid of them. You, you get rid of the seeds. You, you're out of samsara. These are similar to the seeds of, of the afflictions in that they are potentialities left by the mental afflictions and likewise are not consciousnesses. However, unlike the seeds, they do not cause mental afflictions to rise again in the future. They are hidden stains, subtle influences, or predispositions left on the mind stream that give rise to a certain false appearance, the appearance of things as inherently existent. You're out of samsara. You got rid of the affliction. Right? You still have these latencies. What do they do? They cause you to still see appearances of inherent existence, even though you're not fooled. And that's like a magician's illusion. Don't fool me, don't fool me, but they're still there. While they're still there occupying, you know, space-time on your little mental theater, you're not omniscient. So that's the idea. You want to be omniscient so you can help beings in the most powerful way. So these imprints remain even after the mental afflictions to get to their seeds have been completely removed. Our hats, as well as bodhisattvas on the eighth level and above, still have these obstructions to omniscience. While they are meditating directly on emptiness, no appearance of true existence arises in their mind. But when they emerge from that meditation session, everything then appears then everything appears to be truly existent again, owing to the ripening of these propensities. Again, there they are. You're out of you're in what is that called? Dreamlike emptiness after the after effects. You don't see them as solid. You see them like you're not a solid film and you're not swayed but they're still coming at you, for want of a better word. So, these practitioners understand that things are not real in the way that they appear, yet that appearance still occurs. That's the better way of saying it. So during the post-meditation period, they see everything as illusion-like. An inherent aspect of things appears, illusion-like everything. That's not, but they know that inherent existence is not real. In contrast, us, we ordinary beings, see things as inherently existent and believe that things truly exist in the way that they appear. If something appears attractive or unattractive, we firmly hold it to be so objectively. That's it. I the case closed. Those who have realized emptiness directly do not hold things this way. They understand that the object does not exist in the way that it appears. And we have run out of time, and we will pick this up on Monday, which is July 3rd. Forget it. We're in July. Of course, we're praying for Miss Regina Smith, Mrs. Smith. Who else will we pray for? I'll see if I can bring up the screen with people here. Let me see who's around. Uh, Darren, they, oh, Darren can see the screen. Connor Brass and Lorna Koppel. Who else? Okay, that's all I can see here. Let's see, someone asked a question. What was the chapter? Is that it?
which version of the Bodhisattva guys was that again? That's the one that Stephen Batchelor translated, the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. The old reliable, I see, I don't have my screen up. Let me put the screen on. There you go. Here it is. This is it. The standard. We have to race through it now. We're almost out of time. So let's get the prayers in. Suits of the Recollection of Noble Three Jewels. I prostrate to the omniscient one. Thus the Buddha, Bhagavata, the Gata, Arahat, Sam, Yaksang, Buddha, the learned and virtuous one, the Sugata, the knower of the world, the charity and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans, is the Buddha Bhagavat. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit. He does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treasures of merit. He is adorned with the minor marks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major marks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those who long with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. His strengths cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. His form is incomparable. He's not stained by the realm of desire. He's not stained by the realm of form. He's not affected by the formless realm. He is completely liberated from suffering. He's completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with datus. His ayatanas are controlled. He has completely cut the knots. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He is crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdom. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavats who rise in the past, present, and future. He does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells on the bhumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavat. The Holy Dharma is good at the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. completely purifies. The Bhagavad teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision. It is free from sickness. It is always timely. It directs one further, seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. The Dharma, which is taught by the Bhagavad, is revealed properly in the Vinaya. It is renunciation. It causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pithy. It is trustworthy Puts and puts an end to the journey. As for the song of the great Yana, they enter completely, they enter insightfully, they enter straightforwardly, they enter harmoniously. They are worthy of veneration with joined palms. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. They are an object of generosity. They are a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses great kindness. The omniscient teacher, the to- basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Tathagatha. Pure, the cause of freedom from passion, virtuous, liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth that prostrates to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they show the path to liberation. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are a holy field of merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha, the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to these three. The Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma's virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. Having faith in these inconceivable, therefore the fruitions are inconceivable. May they be born in a completely pure realm. Prayer for the flourishing of Jay Sankapa's teachings. Though he's the father producer of all conquerors, as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds through this truth. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. When of you are in the presence of Buddha Indraketu, he made his vow to conquer and his offspring, praised his powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a constant prophesied. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. His pure view free of eternity or destruction. His pure meditation cleanse of dark fading and fog. His pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Learn since he extensively sought out learning, reverend, rightly applying it to himself. Good, dedicating all for beings in the doctrine. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scripture is definitive and interpretive without contradiction. Advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Listening to ex- explanations of the three Pitakas, realized teachings, practice of the three trainings, is skilled and accomplished. Life story is amazing. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Outwardly calm and subdued by the hearer's conduct. Inwardly trusting in the two stages practice, he allied without clash the good paths of Sutra and Tantra. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. 
Combining voidness explained as the causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle, heart essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles, may the Concord Losang's teachings flourish. By the power of the ocean of oath-bound doctrine protectors like the main guardians of three beings' paths, the quick-acting Lord by Shurvana Karmayama, may the Concord Losang's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious Guru's live by, lives, by the earth being full of good learned brethren, holders of the teaching, and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the Concord Losang's teachings flourish. Eight verses on training the mind with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel. I will learn to hold them supremely dear. We'll probably go a minute over. I'm sorry. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind and as soon as a disturbing emotion, disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those expressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When the one who had benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and my understanding all phenomena as like illusions be released from the bondage of attachment. Sounds like an auctioneer. Our next class will be mon uh, Saturday at 1 o'clock, uh, White Tara live here. Uh, if you're interested, come. Uh, instructions on the website. And our next Dharma class will be July 3rd at 7 o'clock. We'll continue with the inside section. Thank you very much for participating in this memorial for Mrs. Smith, very dear to our hearts. Big love to all of you.